Uh, so moving on, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Francis Collins, who's currently the Senior Investigator for the Center for Precision Health Research. But most notably, he's the uh, former director of the uh, of NIH and indeed the longest serving uh, director uh, for 12 years. Um, he has a number of achievements in science in his own right. Um, he's a uh, uh, has received the Presidential Medal of Freedom as well as the International Medal of Science, and currently is the uh, champion of developing a national hepatitis C elimination program uh, in the United States. And so, it's, it's indeed my pleasure to introduce Francis to um, to, to open this discussion. Francis. Thanks, John. It's a privilege to be able to speak to this distinguished group and all of the people who are listening to the webinar. I see 150 is the list right now on the participant button here, which is impressive. Um, and of course, uh, we're joined by a remarkable group uh, of leaders in hepatitis C research, including a couple of Nobel laureates. So I know this is going to be a really interesting and productive day. I'm still serving as the White House lead on an initiative to try to eliminate hepatitis C in the United States, taking advantage of the fact that we have highly effective oral agents with 95 plus percent success rates with just one pill a day for something like eight to 12 weeks. And yet that is not reaching the two and a half million people who are currently already chronically infected with hepatitis C and who, as you know, uh, face a potentially very serious outcome if the cure is not made available. There are a combination of reasons why we haven't been able to make that link. The administration, uh, led by the president, strongly seeks this as an opportunity to do something historic and to figure out how we can get uh, those direct acting antivirals uh, to the people who need them. So there is a proposal that the administration has put forward, which is currently being debated in the U.S. Congress. It has three components. Uh, one is to try to do a better job of developing the kind of testing capacity to enable test and treat in a single visit uh, with a point of care finger stick test that would give an answer about viral RNA in an hour or less because we know from the experience that's been happening over the past few years that we lose a lot of people in what is currently a system that requires as many as three or four visits before starting therapy. And for we have marginalized communities where getting access uh, to the clinic may not be so easy, that is something we ought to be able to fix. That is actually moving along quite well, taking advantage of the RADx program that was designed during COVID to accelerate point of care testing and applying it to hepatitis C. A second component is to try to reduce the overall cost per patient of what is still uh, a course of therapy over eight to 12 weeks that runs to 20 to $24,000 and makes this rather difficult for Medicaid programs and for programs that treat the uninsured or people in prisons to be able to do this. The strategy is to follow the lead that was piloted in Louisiana, the so-called Netflix model, to negotiate with the companies, uh, Gilead and AbbVie, for a flat fee uh, about which much uh, conversation could be had about what would be fair. This has to be kind of a win-win. But once that has been negotiated, then the drugs would be made available for free to anybody on Medicaid, anybody uninsured, anybody in the prison system, anybody on the Native American reservation. And this would also capture lots of people in opioid treatment programs where we know the hepatitis C positivity can be quite high. The third component is to try to provide then better means of healthcare delivery to those marginalized populations, including some creative things uh, such as greater use of telehealth and mobile units and other ways to get access to individuals who currently do not have access uh, to good health care. And that's all folded into uh, this proposal that was announced on March the 9th. It is now in the hands of the Senate in particular, where there's a lot of interest uh, to turn this into legislative language that will capture those various components. We do expect that language to emerge potentially in the next two or three weeks. At that point, then it will be possible for the Congressional Budget Office to do their thing of assessing exactly what is likely to be the cost of this proposed five-year program. We are optimistic that they will come out with a conclusion that indicates that this is not actually costly, it's cost savings because of the healthcare cost reduction that will happen by preventing many cases of liver cancer and the need for liver transplant. 
Our own economist, Jag Chatwall at Harvard, has done an analysis, which is published in a, uh, a preprint server, which looks awfully good, saying that in, even in the first 10 years, which is what CBO cares about, the federal government alone would save $13.3 billion in health care costs if this program was initiated now. And we don't believe it'll cost that much to run the program. So this should end up uh, in a good place. CBO has been talking uh, to Dr. Chatwell. So there's already a conversation going on about that. But in order to get over the finish line, this is going to take bipartisan support uh, in both houses. Right now, we have more action going on in the Senate than the House. The House, of course, just came back from August recess and are a bit distracted right now. Uh, but there are some supporters in the House that have emerged, uh, particularly those who know something about this disease and have to mention Hank Johnson, uh, who is a hep C survivor, uh, as one of those really powerful spokespersons. And on the Senate side, Senator Bill Cassidy, being a liver doctor who had a lot to do with that Louisiana pilot, is also a strong source of support and has certainly been talking this up with his colleagues. But it's going to take a big push. Uh, the advocates have organized. Uh, there are 126 organizations that have joined together, uh, sending letters to the Hill and making visits uh, to members of Congress uh, to raise consciousness about this. But I think it's still the case that most members of Congress and most of the public haven't quite heard about this historic opportunity uh, to actually do something we don't get to do very often, which is to take a terrible disease and reduce its incidence so much to the point that new cases will also start to drop in their frequency. And there's a lot of analysis of what that would look like. I'm fortunate in my efforts here to be assisted by Dr. Rachel Florence, who many of you know, who's my senior advisor and continues to put 100% of her time on this, but also now to have the assistance of Drs. Josh Sharfstein and Risha Irvin of Hopkins, who are now on IPAs uh, to NIH to assist with this part-time and bring a wealth of experience about how to get things like this done. All that being said, if we're successful and if this finds its way into the budget for, for next year, and that is our goal, to try to have something ready to fold into that very messy process called the omnibus in December, which we still hope will happen, and then this could in fact get underway uh, fairly quickly because there's a very detailed plan and a strong support across HHS of all of the agencies that would be necessary for implementation. Everybody's excited about the chance to do this. But none of that will uh, eliminate the need for a vaccine, which is what you all are here to talk about. In fact, it, we'll see what the legislative language looks like. The president's proposal includes some money to actually speed up and accelerate the search for an effective vaccine, because we know that could use a boost. Uh, we'll see whether that makes it through the congressional filtering, uh, but that would certainly be an important part of this. Because as we all know, uh, getting cured of hepatitis C with a direct acting antiviral does not prevent you from potentially being reinfected. And if we really want a solution, not just for the US, but the whole world, that's what we need. And that's what you all are there to talk about uh, today. And I wish you Godspeed in figuring out how best to, to achieve that goal with new technologies like mRNA, perhaps providing a boost in the opportunity and the discussion you're going to have today about creative ways uh, to do testing, uh, perhaps involving volunteers. So thanks for the chance uh, to say a few things before you kick off uh, the real part of the meeting. And I wish you all the best. And we wish you all the best in that effort, Francis. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, um, let me turn it over to uh, uh, my longtime colleague, uh, Jake Liang. Uh, Jake is currently the Chief of Liver Diseases Branch and Deputy Director of Translational Research of NIDDK and has been um, at the forefront of, um, of this uh, development of a CHIM model for ECV vaccine development. Jake? Thank you, John, and thank you, Francis, for your introductions. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, let me put on uh, share mode. Okay, great. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, web symposium. Uh, thank, thanks to Francis for sort of laying the ground for the need for developing a vaccine. So I don't need to speak more on the importance of HCV vaccine and achieving the goal of HCV eliminations. For various reasons that I don't have time to go into, efforts to develop an effective HCV vaccine has stalled over the last decade. We are not here today to discuss fully the pitfalls, barriers, and strategies in HCV vaccine development. Suffice to say, without a convenient animal model to test the efficacy, 
of a vaccine candidate, we are doomed to falter. In this symposium, we are raising the prospect of a controlled human infection chin as an alternative to fast track and promote HCV vaccine development. Chip model is a model in which human volunteers are deliberately infected with infection agents for the purpose of testing the efficacy of a candidate vaccine for these agents. This concept is not new. It was first applied by Edward Jenner more than 200 years ago in developing the smallpox vaccine. It has subsequently been applied to other infectious agents, including yellow fever, cholera, malaria, influenza, and dengue, and now to more than 25 infectious agents. I also want to mention that for the cholera vaccine, all efficacy data that serve as a basis for regulatory approval were obtained from CHIM studies. When the CHIM concept for HCV vaccine development was first presented to the HCV community a few years ago, people look at me incredulously with the ex exclamations of, you're trying to do what? Probably because we were so used to the idea that HCV is a terrible disease. And why would you want to do that? Many of us have spent our entire career trying to understand and beat this virus. I can understand why such a concept is contrarian to what we have all been working toward. Perhaps the rapid advances as Francis mentioned, in highly effective HCV treatment have changed all that perception to date. The point is that we need an HCV vaccine and can we leverage this sea change events to achieve this goal? And it was in late 2020 and beginning of 2021, if you all remember, there was a height of the COVID pandemic and we, um, we were all sheltered in place and couldn't go anywhere, couldn't do our work. So this concept was really sort of came up and a few of us figured out maybe since we couldn't really do anything else, why don't we organize a workshop to really discuss, at least broach the subjects with the scientific community. And um, so this is really the genesis of the first workshop. And I wrote to all my colleagues in the HCV community and they all thought, hey, you know, they were chomping at the bits, hey, I really, same thing, we're not really doing anything else, so why don't we get together and just start discussing the feasibility of this model. And this led to a sounding board opinion piece by myself, Jordan uh, Fell, Andrea Cox, and Charlie Rice in New England Journal of Medicine. And then we thought we probably should follow up with a more detailed workshop, and that was the genesis of the second workshop held in Toronto in 2022. So the rationale for a control human infection models, um, uh, not only because we really don't have a convenient animal model to test the efficacy, but also there are several other reasons. First is to accelerate early vaccine development. This model can de-risk vaccine candidate selections with early efficacy and safety testing before large late phase trials. It can also reduce costs. The second is that this model can inform vaccine development and designs because of the detailed immunological, virologic studies and clinical correlate that can come from some of the early CHIN studies. And finally, this model can be used to assess promising vaccine candidates as a possible pathway to regulatory approval. As I mentioned, the cholera vaccine was developed entirely from uh, CHIMP's uh, data. And also, when you look at the sort of the large clinical trial, such as uh, the, the VIP trial to test the adenovirus vaccines, if we use this model correctly, we can actually generate more infection cases to determine efficacy than a traditional field trial for vaccine efficacy, such as the VIP trial. Because if you look at the VIP trial, when they, after they recruit six or 700 patients, only probably about 75 incidental HCV infection cases, and only 45 of them were used for final analysis. So we can easily achieve that number in a well-controlled uh, monitor chin study. So obviously, 
we need a systematic approach to look at this particular question of control human infection model and in HCV. Many of you, uh, we're going to hear from many of the speakers and panelists about all the different aspects of, uh, of this systematic approach. I'm not going to steal their thunder, but just want to quickly highlight some of the important points. Obviously, the clinical parameter, such as a high DAA response, really is really sort of the initial stage that we potentially could proceed with this model. Although the rate is high, we need to think carefully about how some of the patient may not respond, whether they will respond to, to a second treatment, and that will also be addressed in another talk. Another concern is that even with such acute infection, we can cure these patients. What are the long-term risks of acute HCV infection? That will also be discussed in the talk. And clearly, ethical consideration is going to be critical. About We have engaged in several about ethicists to discuss this issue, the importance of social value and potential risk, are very important to determine whether this is ethically appropriate to proceed. And certainly we need to pass a uh, regulatory uh, agency. We have uh, begun discussion with uh, US FDA and Health Canada about how what the concern of the regulatory agencies are. And clearly the source of inoculum would be important to how we're gonna use that to in our chip model. And finally, Clinical trial design is probably very critical in how we can design an ethically appropriate, fully informed uh, clinical study to apply this chip model for vaccine development. Obviously, we need to do it in various stages and starting with inoculants and maybe some sentinel cohort as well, and then eventually to vaccine testing. Again, this will be the focus of another talk later on today. So, after the Toronto workshop, and a few of us thought that, well, why don't we? put all these uh, concepts and discussions and all the nuances on CHIMP model for HCV on paper. So we have um, recruited various different uh, uh, investigators. Many of them will speak in this, uh, in this uh, symposium as well as panelists. And so we put together the supplement that just published in clinical infectious disease that really cover full gamut of little different topics. So although this symposium will be used to discuss a lot of these uh, important points. So if you're interested in looking at some of the details, I will refer to you to this uh, a link here that will be also flashed in the, in the chat box. So feel free and all the articles are open access so everybody can look at it. So now today really comes down to today, we thought maybe it's a good way to put all, get all of us together to really talk about it and to have a real conversation on the potential and feasibility of the CHIMP model. So we're gonna begin with uh, a, a talk on the ethics uh, and then moving on to taking a perspective from the participants. And then we'll uh, follow with a panel discussion on this, these couple issues. And then the next uh, session will be on uh, the clinical parameters such as the DAA treatment for acute and recent HCV infections, uh, as well as addressing the long-term consequences of result acute HCV infections. That'll be followed by a second panel discussion, and then we'll take a necessary biological break. And then moving on to uh, really, I consider it's a really important part of the symposium to look at what particular would be feasible in terms of the challenge inoculant for HCV chimps, followed by a clinical trial designs and, and, and end up with a various different basic science study that we can do since the, the model really offers unprecedented opportunity to study HCV infection. And then we'll end with the last uh, panel discussions. And we'll also do something fun. We'll ask three questions to the audience so everybody can chime in and take a poll. And, uh, and, and I think we'll, and these are sort of important questions. We won't reveal them yet. We will reveal them at the beginning of the third panel. So if you do say it around, please uh, chime in and offer your opinions. It'll be totally confidential, very simple questions. And yes and no, maybe answer. So you can click on it and then we'll share the results with you at the end. So without further ado, I will stop sharing my talk and moving to the next speaker to be taught by Dr. Charles Weir. He's a professor of medicine and philosophy at Western University in London, Canada. 
Unfortunately, Charles won't be able to present in person because um, he has COVID. He showed that really COVID is still around. And uh, he was actually quite thoughtful when he was first diagnosed with COVID a few days ago uh, because he was exposed to, to somebody who had COVID. He thought, well, he probably should uh, put a recorded talk together in case he couldn't make it. And uh, so he prepared to send it to us. We kind of uh, was hoping he would join us as a, either as a panel discussion or present, but unfortunately um, he is uh, somewhat symptomatic. So he preferred not to join. So please join me in wishing Charles a speedy recovery. And certainly we're very thankful for him to, to put together this recorded talk. And otherwise I will have to step in to talk. You probably don't want to hear me talking about ethics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, uh, share the recording. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you today. It's a pleasure to speak to you about uh, the, the body is a little low. Hepatitis Can somebody turn it up? Human infection studies. This is, I think, the, the top level for the video. So just please turn it up on your computer so you can be able to hear. Okay, thank you. More than 20 infectious agents have been researched in controlled human infection studies over the past decades. These infectious agents cause a spectrum of human disease from the benign, such as the common cold, to the serious, such as malaria and cholera. Controlled human infection studies, or CHIMS, have led to important knowledge gains. They've played a role in the development of vaccines to prevent cholera, dengue fever, influenza, and malaria. And modern CHIMS have a remarkable safety record. And this is, I think, a testament to the lengths that scientists go to protect healthy volunteers in these studies. For example, of 6,000 participants in malaria and influenza studies, only four serious adverse events have been reported. And no one has died in a modern CHIM study, not one person. So, would it be ethical to intentionally infect healthy volunteers with hepatitis C in a CHIM? I think until the last few, few years, the idea was uh, kind of unthinkable. Writing two decades ago, uh, Frank Miller and Christine Grady wrote that uh, CHIM studies were on a spectrum, arrayed from clearly acceptable on one end to clearly unacceptable on the other end. They wrote that clearly unacceptable would be controlled human infection models in which infections are induced for which treatment is non-existent or ineffective, symptoms are intolerable, or serious morbidity or mortality is likely to result. For example, hepatitis C. But circumstances have changed with the development of highly effective direct acting antivirals for the treatment of hepatitis C. And I think it's now timely to ask, are hepatitis C CHIMS ethically permissible? <clears throat> In a paper published uh, last month with colleagues, we set out a framework for the ethical conduct of such studies. Our 10 point framework sets out key ethical considerations for the design and conduct of controlled human infection studies with hepatitis C. We believe that studies that satisfy our 10 point framework are ethically permissible. In what follows, I'll briefly discuss each ethical requirement. First, hepatitis C CHIM studies must have sufficient social value. And this means that CHIMS must generate knowledge likely to be used to advance the goal of a global elimination of hepatitis C. Despite the existence of highly effective direct acting antivirals, treatment as prevention has faltered globally 
due to limited access to hepatitis C diagnostics and treatment, and unfortunately also due to high reinfection rates. Plainly, a vaccine is needed, but development is currently hindered by high costs, the lack of an available animal model, and the practical challenges of conducting a field trial. CHIM studies can provide um, preliminary efficacy data, allowing researchers to prioritize vaccine candidates for field trials. And efficacy data from CHIM studies themselves may inform regulatory approval of a novel vaccine. Second, studies must have a reasonable risk-benefit profile. This means that risks to participants and third parties must be minimized, and risks must stand in reasonable relation to the social value of the study. The risks of acute infection with hepatitis C are quite low. Most people are asymptomatic, and the risks of severe acute hepatitis is less than one in a thousand. Further, Direct-acting antivirals are highly effective with cure rates approaching 100% in this setting. Participant safety can be augmented through study design. In the first stages of the development of a controlled human infection model, the first participants should be infected and treated sequentially to ensure that people can be infected safely and treated successfully. Further, the safety of a three-month delay in treatment should be established before increasing the duration of untreated infection. <clears throat> Third, hepatitis C CHIM study sites must be carefully selected. CHIMs should only be conducted at hepatitis C referral centers with the clinical expertise to care for patients and treat any complications. Further, sites should have a track record of conducting high-quality clinical trials. And finally, sites should have a strong relationship with the community, including people living with or with experience of hepatitis C and people who inject drugs. Fourth, participant selection must be fair. Participant selection should prioritize minimizing risk to participants and third parties. To minimize risk to participants, they should be healthy volunteers, 18 to 40 years of age, who lack comorbid comorbidities or liver risk factors. Participants must, at the time of enrollment, provide written consent to direct acting antiviral treatment upon study withdrawal or completion. Risks to third parties must also be minimized. Participants must agree to notify intimate partners and use condoms for sexual intercourse until virological cure has been documented. People who engage in behaviors associated with transmission of hepatitis C should be excluded from CHIM studies. <clears throat> Fifth, hepatitis C CHIM studies require robust consent procedures to ensure informed, voluntary, and comprehending consent is obtained from competent adults. Information should be communicated to prospective participants using evidence-based methods to promote understanding. Researchers should partner with clinical educators and stakeholders to develop educational materials to support the consent process. Prospective participants should have the opportunity to discuss the study one-on-one -on -one with research staff. And the prospective participants' comprehension should be formally tested. Any gaps identified should be addressed through education and retested. Okay, so those are the first five requirements in our, in our framework, and this is a brief visual interlude. So uh, let's now uh, carry on to the final requirements of the framework. Sixth, participants in studies should be compensated. Participants ought to be reimbursed for reasonable expenses, including childcare, parking, and transportation. Further, participants ought to be compensated for time spent performing study activities, such as attending clinic visits. Being a study participant is akin to unskilled labor. Accordingly, 
Participants ought to be paid at the locally applicable hourly minimal, minimum wage for unskilled work. Consideration may be given to modest compensation in addition to this for, for the time that participants spend infected. Additional financial incentives, though, we think are best avoided. Seventh, hepatitis C CHIMS uh, should engage relevant stakeholders both to inform the study's design and promote transparency and accountability. Achieving the ultimate goal of hepatitis C vaccine development requires engagement with researchers and pharmaceutical companies developing vaccines, as well as regulators on scientific aspects of the CHIM. <clears throat> engagement with prospective participants, including people who've participated in other CHIMs and advocacy organizations, may usefully inform study procedures, as well as recruitment and consent materials. Finally, as future trials of vaccine candidates will require community support, it's critical to engage early people living with or with experience of hepatitis C and people who inject drugs. Eighth, studies should be conducted in fair and open scientific partnerships. Researchers should publish the protocol for these studies as soon as possible. Once established, researchers should make available the inoculating agent to qualified scientists at other centers who are planning to conduct hepatitis C CHIMS. Finally, researchers are encouraged to agree on a common set of outcome measures and share their own data to facilitate pooling data across studies. Ninth, Hepatitis C CHIM studies require independent ethical review and oversight. Studies must, of course, be reviewed and approved by a research ethics committee. The research ethics committee should have experts in the clinical care of hepatitis C, as well as representation from relevant stakeholder communities. Hepatitis C CHIM should be overseen by an independent data and safety monitoring board and researchers should consult the Data and Safety Monitoring Board at major decision points, including escalation of viral dose and extending the duration of the untreated period. Tenth and finally, research ethics, uh, ethics research should be integrated into ongoing studies. Integrated ethics research can be used to make improvements in the study. For instance, knowledge gaps in the evaluation of comprehension of consent information may suggest changes to educational materials, or interviews with participants may suggest changes to the frequency of study visits and the adequacy of compensation. So um, we conclude that it can be ethically acceptable to develop a hepatitis C controlled human infection model. Indeed, when done appropriately, developing such a model should be a priority on the path towards global elimination of hepatitis C. I'd like to thank my co-authors and colleagues Annetta Ridd, Jordan Feld, and Jake Liang. Thanks very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Charles, for presenting. Despite the fact you're not here, we appreciate that. And let's move on to the next um, presentation. And um, who is uh, Jake Evers? He's a communication director of the One Day Sooner organization. He's a community activist as well as advo uh, advocate. So we very much look forward to his perspective on a participant point of view. Uh, Jake, please uh, proceed. Thanks so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Fingers crossed that it works out seamlessly. Awesome, are we good? All right, so 
Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jake. I'm super excited to be here today and kind of talk a little bit about the paper that I was the author on, um, along with other participants, former participants in human challenge studies. Um, you know, I want to start out here and again, thanking Jake Leong and everyone else for organizing this effort. Um, and want to highlight, you know, I am one person. We have kind of survey data in as part of this paper, but my position is, you know, uh, and one day sooner's position is, you know, just one of many. Um, but we do think that it is kind of worth sharing when it comes to volunteering for infection. So a little bit of background about us really quick. Um, we are a nonprofit that advocates for healthy medical research volunteers, particularly people in challenge studies. Um, we've been independently collaborating on these proposed HCV CHIMS. Um, and among our membership base include over 40,000 people across the world who have at some point expressed a specific interest in participating in a CHIM, whether that's for, for any range of diseases. Um, and about me, I'm the communications director um, I'm also a former Shigella challenge participant. Shigellosis causes dysentery. Uh, my mother is super proud because this is kind of the outcome, uh, the kind of sensationalist headline, but very positive article. And I'm very, very proud of my participation. Um, this was at the University of Maryland. I uh, contracted dysentery to uh, help test a vaccine and uh, it was not fun. Dysentery is not fun, but I am very proud of, um, personally proud of my kind of contribution to society. Uh, and hopefully one day um, having gotten sick with, dysentery means that others won't in the future. Um, so the paper that we wrote was called Volunteering for Infection, Participant Perspectives on a Hepatitis C Controlled Human Infection Model. Um, four of the five of us are former uh, human challenge study participants um, for malaria, uh, COVID-19, uh, norovirus, and in my case, Shigella. And then it was a survey of uh, our membership base from English speaking countries where uh, CHIMS are commonly run. And the number of people who passed this, uh, the uh, uh, comprehension questions is about 117. Um, most of these people have not done gyms before, but have expressed a uh, pretty strong interest in them. So this is not a representative sample of the entire population, but it is a, an interesting group to kind of think about the, the problems and issues and potential of HCV chim with. We introduced the concept of the HCV chim and asked them a whole range of questions on their concerns and thoughts and pretty much any feedback they had. Um, overall, there was pretty strong support for the concept. Um, this is not particularly surprising given that this was a group that is predisposed to being kind of favorably uh, oriented towards them. Um, and people were generally in the abstract kind of uh, interested in the idea of volunteering. And so what this kind of like phrases is there's this, you know, group of altruistically minded people who would want to participate in this sort of thing. And the question then becomes, how do you make, you know, best use of this group and uh, when you're designing and implementing a challenge study model, right? Um, so I'm going to start with some of the concerns that were raised. And one of the first ones is not surprising at all. They, the greatest concern was over long-term health effects, right? Um, and there was a strong desire to know, for people to know about um, their health measures during a study. And that would require, you know, things like your bilirubin count, but like kind of, you know, explaining that in the context of normalcy and what that means for your body in the long run. Um, there was lower enthusiasm for longer periods of infection. Um, it's not sure, you know, we're not clear if that's because of just inherent hesitancy or just what that means in terms of longer timelines. Um, but so there would need to be in the kind of mean, uh, uh, the median um, sort of months we presented on a scale, uh, or, or chosen by the participant, uh, the survey participants was about three months. Um, there are plenty of people who went beyond that and people who had lower thresholds, but that was just something to note. 53% um, per of respondents were pretty enthusiastic and said they would even consider participation if they were found to be at slightly higher risk of complication. Um, obviously, Charles pointed out that you would want to select for people who do not have you know, pre-existing conditions. Um, and so I don't think it'd be a good idea to, uh, to utilize this kind of group. But what this does point out is that there are people who do have a higher th risk tolerance threshold if they believe that it is potentially worth it for the greater good. Um, the altruism that's present here, and that is, you know, uh, it is, I think, pretty important, right? So our survey showed that altruism is a pretty strong factor driving people to participate. And that is something that's reflected in medical literature about um, healthy human volunteers more generally. Um, you know, there's a spectrum of uh, motivations, but uh, altruism tends to be one of the primary ones. Um, and yeah, the more altruistic motivations among our survey were to uh, advance medicine and to save lives. And that was, um, those were the two highest ranked uh, motives. 
And so I would argue from this, that scientific utility and impact is thus morally relevant. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I am volunteering my body and my health temporarily to, uh, in hopes of one day making, for instance, a vaccine or contributing to the process that would create a vaccine, um, then you are uh, basically taking advantage in a good sense of my altruism. And I would argue that the uh, subsequent moral uh, onus is on you to make sure that you are doing so in a scientifically valid way, right? And um, that means that there are some situations in which particularly if a participant or group of participants or if participants are concerned with, you know, scientific utility and helping people, there might be a world in which um, some sort of design study design decisions that uh, have, you know, relatively minimal increases in risk, for instance, uh, might not be inherently objectionable if they yield sufficient scientific value. Um, and that means that things like model quality are also pretty important, right? If the CHIM takes 10 years and doesn't actually prove pretty competitive with a field study, um, I would argue on another level too that that kind of um, runs counter to the interests of volunteers themselves. And so things like the speed, the ability for the model to be adopted, um, the capacity of the model and the kind of site for a regulatory pathway, those are all morally relevant factors, I think, when we consider the altruism of healthy human volunteers. Um, and then there's also the transparency aspect. So I think there is an ethical obligation to ensure that the data generated from these bodies of volunteers is made useful to the public to the extent possible, right? Um, One Day Senior is currently working on a transparency pledge for HCV CHIM, which many of you will be hearing more about later. Um, but uh, I would argue that, again, this ability to contribute to the greater good is a benefit of participation for many people, um, or at least a soft benefit. It is a reason that drives them to do so. And so one thing that I think uh, is important is being upfront about why a study is important. And I think this is something that a lot of uh, medical research kind of fails to do. And there are a lot of complicated reasons for this, but often it might just come down to uh, what you often see is this idea that, well, this might help develop a vaccine someday and kind of stopping there. Um, there seems to be a hesitant to kind of describe wider benefits to society. And I would argue that, again, kind of runs counter to the uh, views of volunteers that have been expressed both in this survey and in wider medical literature that show that people really do kind of take this seriously, many of them at least, and um, explaining that is in their interest. Uh, sharing results is a very simple one. You know, uh, the simple write of email a year after the fact can be very helpful. Um, and like I said, you can be a little more specific about the social benefits um, than, you know, quote unquote, helping vaccine research. Um, one thing that we touched on was compensation. I want to disclose here that this gets a little bit more into our author's uh, viewpoints than necessarily what was in this survey. Um, we can say that the survey respondents were more concerned about underpayment versus overpayment when it came to compensation. Um, factors that were seen as relevant to compensation included time and inconvenience, which would be pretty high in an HCV challenge, um, but also things like long-term health risks, which would probably be pretty low, as we're going to hear from later speakers. Um, discomfort slash illness, moderate. I say moderate because my threshold is dysentery, so I might have a weird sort of <laughs> sense of what is uh, acceptable, um, or at least personally tolerable. Um, and then potential benefit to society, which is very, very high. So um, we kind of proposed a pretty high target for a six month infection period when it comes to compensation. Um, at the end of the day, uh, almost any sum of money, whether it's $2,000 or $20,000 is still a lot of money to somebody. So by put, if we limit ourselves to a price ceiling of what is quote unquote reasonable, um, we do not solve what the, the problem of undue inducement, this idea that we might um, induce people to participate in a study for money only. We are just pushing that problem down the socioeconomic ladder. Um, the key issue, I think, is ensuring that informed consent processes are sufficient, and that is independent of money. If, if your informed consent process is sufficiently robust, I would argue that you could hypothetically offer any sum of money, um, and that would not necessarily present an ethical issue per se. Um, there are definitely reasons to avoid, uh, you know, for instance, $20,000 budgets are one of them. Um, too much money can signal, can actually signal uh, to prospective participants that you think the study is risky um, when it might not be, and, or it risky in a way that it might not be. Um, but part of the argument we make in the paper is that we should avoid um, lowering compensation for the sake of lowering compensation. Um, and then the kind of critique we had um, of the market rate sort of model was this uh, underlying argument that um, you know skilled un unskilled labor is not necessarily uh, paid justly or fairly in a market system. And so we want to be cautious about the degree to which we rely on that as a benchmark. So overall, um, you know, what this survey showed was that there, you know, a properly explained HCV CHIM is not outlandishly scary. Um, there are a lot of people who would consider participation on altruistic grounds. Um, and I think a lot of important background information that we provided in our survey um, about, for instance, the extreme difficulty of testing vaccines in the field among people who inject drugs, 
um, the really serious global burden, um, kind of nudges volunteers to decide why they might want to participate, because otherwise they don't quite have the background in the disease to understand the significance of, you know, why a study like this might be really, truly important and transformative for the field. Um, I would again want to emphasize that ensuring studies are efficient and scientifically useful is an issue of respect for volunteers as well. Um, and that valuable contribution should be recognized. In our case, we think that does translate into higher compensation. Um, and I want to emphasize too that I don't think altruism and compensation are mutually exclusive, right? Um, I don't think we would say that firefighters, for instance, um, a firefighters union asking for a higher pay rate um, would be necessarily selfish or would impinge upon the kind of altruism that we associate with that profession. Um, uh, one thing we do bring up really briefly in the study in the paper is this idea of kind of splitting the difference where, for instance, you double compensation, but you take that doubled half uh, and have it act uh, on have basically be a fund that can be directed by the volunteer to some sort of charitable institution. Um, so there are a lot of ways to go about increasing compensation, um, but overall, um, there are ways that can also be a little bit more perhaps tangible or, or palatable to IRBs. So um, that is all I have to offer. I think uh, I'm really excited, um, you know, as one of the communications director to uh, continue assisting with the development of this model. We think it's going to be very, very important. Uh, and we're super excited, as is our volunteer base, um, about the prospect of accelerating vaccine development for um, hepatitis C. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jake, for that wonderful presentation from a perspective that we often don't hear about and probably should pay a lot more attention to it. So um, again, let's go ahead with uh, our first panel discussion, which would be uh, led by um, David, uh, Dr. David Thomas, who's a professor of medicine and epidemiology in Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. Bloomberg School of Public Health and Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine. Uh, David, please uh, proceed with uh, the panel. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jake. And uh, to both of our presenters, thanks for those terrific talks. We, uh, Jake, I'd love it if you stay on the panel, and we also are joined by uh, Dr. Andrea Cox, who's a professor of medicine, Johns Hopkins. Jake Liang is uh, going to participate. Kim Page, a professor at University of New Mexico, uh, and Daniel Raymond from the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. Uh, so um, thanks to all of you for unmuting, for making yourselves visible so we can tell who's on the panel. And, um, and we'll kick off with, so, so um, I, unfortunately, Charles won't be able to, to be on the panel for the reasons that Jake already mentioned, but um, let's go ahead and try to get into some of these um, subjects that, uh, that, that both speakers brought up. Let's start out with this issue of compensation right off the bat. And, and Jake, you, you just said, you know, that, that, um, uh, whereas the, the pure uh, ethical consideration wants to keep compensation low to in, in, in avoid unfair inducements to, to coercion, if you will, um, then the, the participants have a slightly different take on it, that, that actually that sort of thing can be managed in various ways. And I'm wondering, we have um, uh, Donald, who, uh, D Donald Brown, who I didn't introduce, but who's uh, I had extensive experience um, participate running research studies and uh, participating and um and and Daniel I wonder if you if the two of you would want to comment on that uh issue and then Jake any other comments that you would want to have on this issue of of how do you balance the right amount of of, of uh, compensation or um, reimbursement if you will Well, well, for me, Dr. Thomas, first and foremost, good morning, and it is a pleasure to be a part of this panel discussion. Uh, how do you balance the, how do you balance it? I always look at the amount of time, uh, the uh, amount of blood that is going to, would be required, and, and honestly, honestly, really, really appreciating the time that any participant put forth that we recruit brings to the table and, and understanding that we have to compensate them for their time. This has been my experience over the last uh, probably 20 years or more with conducting outreach uh, in community, working with syringe exchange, compensation for research participants have always been an issue. And that's the one thing that will continue to affect any recruitment trial moving forward. Daniel? 
I don't have a bright line here. Um, I think there is a meaningful difference between compensation and inducement, um, that the level of compensation should not be perceived as an inducement that could uh, be interpreted as potentially exploitative. I, this has obviously been a big debate in things like uh, organ donations um, and so forth. So I think that there's probably an extensive bioethical literature out there, uh, but compensation is certainly appropriate, but I think there's also perhaps a higher degree of uh, challenge to uh, ensure that the CHIM studies are seen as having integrity, uh, because I think that there will be a considerable degree of scrutiny from people who are not necessarily familiar with this model and maybe bringing a various various lenses to how to understand this as uh, as an ethical approach. Yeah, thanks. I don't know if if the other uh, panelists want to weigh in on this. I, I'll just speak for myself, and and I've heard and read ethical uh, takes on this, and of course we're all familiar with uh, uh, Dr. Alter's work showing the huge improvements in the safety of the blood supply switching to an all volunteer compared to a compensated donor pool. So, um, but I, I will say when I read. Um, Jake and, and his co-workers article and heard it from participant side. And then this idea that getting Shigella or, or hepatitis would be um, compensated at a level of a minimal unskilled worker. It, it did feel a little um, like I, I really felt like that was a very important uh, perspective to, to listen to and to uh, for us all to sort of adjust to hearing from um, um the the persons who might be so altruistic as to to donate their their bodies for this cause. Yeah, if I may, you know, I have a lot of risk. I re recognize that this is a really ethically fraught problem, and I don't have any sort of um, animus towards people who I think have done a lot of thought and have concluded that an implicit price ceiling, for instance, might be important. The kind of things I wanted to highlight were, I think, the contradiction of what I'm going to call the kind of price ceiling, right? Because I also think Dan, uh, uh, I think Dan is right. Um, you know, there's a public perception aspect at play too, which is a separate kind of issue, but but related. But in terms of, for instance, so for my, I take it kind of at a personal level. You know, I was the Shigella study that I was in involved um, injection with an experimental vaccine uh, and a 10 day inpatient, um, in addition to you know drinking a little shot glass of the Shigella bacteria. That study originally paid around $3,200, and shockingly, uh, very few people signed up, but some did, and they had to over double that compensation. Um, I did not see that study until after that compensation had been doubled, um, but I can pretty confidently say that the original like $3,200 was just not something that would have worked out for me. Um, people are just on a spectrum. I have a colleague who is in a, uh, one of the co-authors, Alistair Fraser Urquhart, uh, was in a challenge study, was paid about 4,500 pounds and donated every single penny of that to charity. I'm not nearly as good of a person as he is. Um, and so, but I think that um, the ultimate, I think the argument that became most persuasive to me was that, you know, for instance, $3,000 or $7,000 is a lot of money to somebody, right? That is like months of rent potentially. So I was working a, you know, office job in DC. So $7,000 was a lot of money, but not life changing sums of money, but that is life changing sum of money to somebody somewhere. So a price ceiling does not necessarily solve that problem. It just pushes it down the socioeconomic ladder. Um, and then the final thing I try to bring up is, and I'll use the example of DC, the living wage in DC in May of 2022 was about $22.50 an hour. That's that for a single person without children. Um, the immediate or like the 75th percentile, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for a fast food worker, an unskilled laborer, a kind of type, uh, you know, the type, the typified unskilled laborer was about $17 an hour in the DC area. And so I think we need to be really careful about tethering uh, pay to the market because there is a very big difference that from you know a market rate versus what is a just rate. And I would argue that not paying a living wage in this case would like, even though you're not trying to get people to live off of it, um, I think it's an example of, it kind of shows how uh, relying on that market rate as a threshold is maybe a little bit more ethically fraught than I think it may be thought to be. Thanks. Thanks, Jake. And while you're still unmuted, I'd like to come back to and flesh out this uh, other really important issue that 
that you touched on um, and, and that Charles did as well, which is, which is ensuring that there is value to the study that there's that people are donating their bodies for uh with the idea that there'll be some important scientific contribution you know as being on the other side of the fence we're we're um just i guess i'm starting to wonder how certain would we need to be um obviously we'd want to ensure that a study was going to be uh, have a high likelihood of giving a meaningful result but there Others have brought up even more extreme um, views that perhaps you need to have all the money in place for the phase three. You need to have a company ready to, to, to say that they'll pay for, for ultimate production and worldwide distribution. You need to ensure access to low and middle income countries. Where, where do you think that as someone that's donated your own time and body, where, where does the line finish I mean, where, where do what how much confidence would you need to have yeah i think that actually comes in there are kind of two levels i think here so there's confidence that within the study that you are designing right that it is being done to maximize potential scientific utility i think that is pretty important um and i think as i mentioned briefly there there's this idea of people sometimes being willing to accept increased risk to to reach that point um if it's properly explained i don't think that should be discounted a good example you know if for instance when you're collecting the inoculum the inocula for HCV chem, um, you know, you could theoretically stagger it one person at a time for uh, years, right? And that would technically provide a better safety profile before moving on to larger groups, but that would sort of defeat the purpose of moving quicker, right? And so at some point we do make implicit sort of, or explicit calculations of what minimal increase in risk is possible for volunteers. At the meta level, I don't think you need to be, like, I think it would be, you know, a sort of wild goose chase, or I think it'd be impossible, right, to um, you know, argue for it. Like you could never do that for a vaccine study, right? You could never look someone in the eyes and say, you know, yeah, you know, 90% of phase two vaccine candidates fail. So in all likelihood, this one, like you can't, yeah, I think within the study, sort of like the intra, uh, intra study kind of um, scientific validity and utility is really important. I don't think you need to lie or pretend that science is a predictable endeavor and that you can predict the future. You know, so much depends. There's so much that goes into whether a vaccine is effective, uptake, you know, the other timelines, um, you can't predict that. Uh, and I don't think you need to, I think making a reasonable statement that you would, that you make to the IRB and regulators when you submit this study um, is fine. Um, saying, you know, this could very much help move the, back, the needle forward on creating a vaccine. It, there might be a meteor strike in 10 years that destroys all biopharmaceutical manufacturing capacity. Um, having to kind of like line up every single duck in a row, I think is not, uh, that's not something I think that volunteers would demand and think that is, I don't think it's probably possible. Yeah, I see Jake's hand up and I will call on him and also uh, encourage others if you have something to say to pop your hand up so I can recognize you. Yeah, I, I, I like to explore this question a little further about the duration of the study, right? I mean, Jake, you, you mentioned that in your survey that most people thought three months was okay, but the question is really, if it's necessary to extend to six months for scientific justifiable reason to test the efficacy of the vaccine, do you think that make that big a difference to the volunteer three months versus six months? Obviously, symptoms and other complications of being infected is a consideration, right? If you have to deal with three months symptom versus six months of symptom, I imagine when you did the, uh, the volunteer study of the dysentery, the shorter the better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the question, but the, we all know for hepatitis C, most of the time it's very mildly symptomatic. You, you know, most of the people don't even have it. So is that a sort of a consideration for volunteers if, you know, whether three months versus six months, that big a difference and understanding that the longer you infect the, 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 the slightly increased risk you may have. But I think for a clinical study, three versus six months really doesn't Right. have any difference in terms of clinical outcome. So I just want to kind of ask you from the sort of participant point, point of view, what, I mean, if we, this we explain clearly to the participants, whether three versus six months makes a big, that's a big a difference. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, I think that is a very easy and compelling argument to make, you know, the limitation of a survey like this is people like are kind of going in, you know, once they reach that question, they have 
a kind of vision of the HCV chim in their head. Um, and the kind of pro like the inherent sort of framing issue of giving someone a slider with months on it, they tend to kind of go towards the median. And we put six months as the maximum because that was what we understood as you know the maximum timeline. Um, there were kind of sub questions that that implied that people would be willing to, for instance, you know, were, were more receptive to a longer timeline um, if there were some scientific value to it. So I don't think, yeah, I, I would say don't I don't think you know three or six months makes or breaks it. I think. Um, you know, the compensation thing is helpful, uh, you know, living with a stigmatized disease that requires, you know, significant changes to your lifestyle and significant burden. Um, that is like a relevant factor. And naturally, someone would want to do that for less time than more time, all, all else being equal. And so I think compensation can help offset that, um, that burden. But um, yeah, I think, you know, so much of it comes down to when we're talking about, you know, well scientifically explained concepts. I've read a lot of informed consent documents right now. I'm actually screening for another medical study, fun fact, which disclaimer is not like a requirement of my job. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> it's you know, personal joy. But, um, you know, so much of it kind of is presented as fait accompli and there's not a whole lot of explanation of benefit to society or how the decisions that were made about, you know, what my body would go under uh, in terms of risk came about, right? IRB decisions are often, you know, kind of a black box. You guys clearly put a lot of thought into this about what risk tolerances are uh, acceptable and shoving that all into an informed consent document might not be feasible, but um, demons showing you know, kind of showing the work, I think is, is potentially very useful for people who are interested and might be interested. I don't know if that entails like an appendix saying like, you know, here's the research, you know, here's a summary of the research that made us think that, you know, six months versus three months, uh, is not particularly like, is not a particularly significant difference in terms of your health risks, things like that. So yeah, I, bottom line, I think I wouldn't, you know, I don't, I would not look at that three month median figure and be too afraid that no one's ever going to do six months. Um, you know, I think provided there is legitimate scientific purpose, which there is, then that's not um, going to be a huge hindrance. But it definitely, I mean, all those equal will be harder because you're asking someone to do something for longer. Yeah, that's, thank you. And I do want to to delve a bit more into the consent process and even the issues of whether, as, as was mentioned by Charles, that we need to have a test of comprehension and how all that would work, that dynamic of how much to disclose, how much is comprehensible, those are all, I'd like to hear um, other voices on that. Um, but I see, uh, are those the points that uh, Andrea, you and Michael want to raise or should we take your comments first before we uh, shift more focus on the consent? I'll defer to Michael and then I'll make my comments. Michael. Uh, well, I was addressing one of the issues you raised, David, about um, are there companies out there that will take on development and delivery of the vaccine if a successful CHIM um, is demonstrated. Um, so let me just translate it to a question to Jake. Um, great, great talk, Jake. Thanks for all of your tremendous efforts. But for the other CHIM trials uh, against all these multiple pathogens, were there companies committed to developing the vaccine if um, if and when the chims are shown to be successful. Because with hep C, it has been difficult to get the big vaccine companies um, to commit to developing a vaccine. Uh, I've had several interactions, Moderna, BioNTech, GSK, Sanofi Pasteur, and none of them, uh, certainly up until today, to my knowledge, were willing to develop a hep C vaccine. They did not consider it profitable enough. Um, what I can say really quick is that, you know, the studies, most of these studies are not characterization studies, right? So the one I was in, for instance, was a vaccine candidate that had been developed um, by Institut Pasteur in France and the University of Maryland. Um, and so, uh, and for malaria, for instance, a lot of the malaria chims are sponsored by um, you know, the various biotech companies that are trying to fight malaria. So I think, um, you know, I can't speak to the, unfortunately, the wider kind of landscape, but I do, you know, because usually once you get to the HCV, or once you get to the CHIM vaccination level, the answer, or the vaccine trial, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I think there's maybe an argument to be made that once the CHIM is established, that is a signal to the field that it's going to become a lot easier to test. And so that will kind of rev up um, the circumstances. Some internal research one day sooner is done has suggested that there are, and I'm sure you're probably even more aware of this than we are, there are well over a dozen potential candidates in the early, early stages. Um, 
but yeah, so it's, uh, I can't speak to the, like in general, how chimps work with, like that in the, in the early stage of a chim establishment. Yeah. Well, it might mean that, you know, public funding needs to play an important role to, to take the vaccine over the line. Um, but to do that, get it through phase three, you know, normally, <laughs> always that's done by private companies, to my knowledge. So I don't know, there might be a, an additional requirement from the governments of the world to combine funding to do this, because um, right now companies don't seem very motivated. That's a great point. And that's, I think that uh, is why I brought that up. So we have Andrea, uh, Harvey Alter, and then Susanna Nagy in that order. Yeah, I, I wanted to address the issue that, you know, we might need a company ready to pick up a vaccine at the end. And, and I do think that CHIM will, will probably follow phase ones where people are not being challenged. So we'll have some sense that the immunogenicity of these vaccines is good. But um, one of the things that I think dampens enthusiasm for development of a vaccine, including from big pharma, is the notion that it's hard, It's going to be exceptionally challenging to do. But I will say that taking the vaccine candidate that we did test, which didn't have a neutralizing envelope, you know, didn't have envelope and couldn't induce neutralizing antibodies, we saw what has not been seen in a single HIV vaccine trial to date, which is suppression of peak viremia in those who are vaccinated. So our first try, while the vaccine didn't protect, it did have an effect on the virus. And I, I think, as I said, that that's not been the case in other vaccine trials. So I do think there's a foundation upon which we can build and create an effective vaccine. And I think that the more we develop things that induce immunogenicity that's robust, the more likely we are to be able to find someone who's willing to carry that forward. And I think that having a challenge virus that is homogeneous across recipients will help tremendously because some people cleared the infection in the vaccine trial we did, some people suppressed viremia, others did not. And the heterogeneity of the patient population plus the viruses with which they were infected adds complexity to that analysis that could be eliminated by the CHIM. So just as Jake Liang said in his remarks, the ability to control some of those variables will help us to understand how to make better vaccines and as well as making them quickly with the CHIM. Thanks, uh, Harvey, then Susanna, and then Donald, and I think we'll be out of time. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Michael's raised an, an interesting point, uh, but I think we need to divorce uh, the concept of having a company ready to go from the concept of CHIM. CHIM is, is a preemptive step, uh, a unique kind of thing that we're actually getting ready for what we hope will come. And since we know that the vaccine is what we really need, uh, that the, the test and treat strategy will work in some areas, but it's not going to be a universal cure. Uh, and we do need the vaccine. And we do, so we, we need to get ready for it. When somebody is ready to have the vaccine, we have to have a way to test it. And that's what this is all about. So everything Andrew just said is, 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 is valid and, and true. And I think uh, I think we're on the right path. This is this is really kind of unique to plan ahead, and be ready to go when something good is there. And on the other hand, I think having the CHIM model and the right inoculum will induce companies, will help to induce companies to, to go this very costly path uh, and shorten the clinical trials and all that. So I think we're on the right track. Thank you, Harvey. Susanna. Yeah. Uh, so, Dave, I was going to go back to the um, to the informed consent issue, if that's okay, for a second. And you know, there are probably folks on who are experts in this in this area. But I think this is a great opportunity to think about engaging the community and um, how they would want to consume that type of information. 
Um, I think it provides an opportunity to think about um, an informed consent process that does not involve a 25-page written document. Um, and I think it's going to be really important to understand what pieces of information and in what way should that be delivered uh, to potential participants so that they can make the most equitable and fair informed decision. Yeah, that's that's actually exactly where I was going to go um, with that, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Donald. You've you've done a lot of in, uh, informed consent uh, over the years, and you've used a variety of instruments. Did you do it for the VIP trial? Yes, we did. Uh, and Can you comment me, uh, on how that went? Do you feel like uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I was just going to piggyback on what Suzanne was stating is that take it to the community, do some focus groups, engage the community. And one of my concerns was with the uh, the target population. When, when you talk about 18 to 40, I, I know that would be challenging as you're not seeing many young adults transition into uh, injecting drug use. But uh, I know focus groups has been paramount when we bring anything to community, we need to get the feedback from the community before we launch any community trials. I know I honestly can say I have an excellent, me and the team, we have an excellent relationship with community engagement of the stakeholders in the community, and we have to take it to the stakeholders, to those who we wish to include and bring them to the table so we can get their feedback on what is appropriate, as well as compensation for such a relative uh, trial. Uh, I think it's an excellent trial. It's something that's long overdue do and we know how desperately we need it but we cannot move forward without community input from all those involved mm -hmm. so donald would that mean just to push that point let's say that that all of us the doctors people would say oh there, there might be one in a ten thousand risks that somebody might have a higher chance of getting a cryoglobulin vasculitis okay some big word like that like would, would that be something worth putting, trying to explain in two pages on the consent form? First, what is it? Then what is one in 10,000? And then testing to see if there's comprehension. Or do we leave that kind of detail um, as much as the lawyers would like to have us all ha have it in there? Do we leave it out? We leave it out. <laughs> we leave it out. We're we're going verbatim for the consent. And then we're going over that consent with the client verbatim. And the longer consents, we have a tendency to lose those clients. You know, we have a tendency to lose them. So, you know, as 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 much as we know the importance on the lawyer side is critical, I would say leave it out always because we need to have a good relationship with explaining it to the and and, and not a 30 page or 20 page. I would say just a consent that is relatively easy to explain that we can go over with our clients in detail. Volunteers. Let's have the last word be from Kim Page, who, along with Anjia, ran the only uh, phase two study for hep C vaccine. Yeah, I do want to note that in our previous trial, we did a lot of really interesting community engagement. And so it's not, you know, it's it's not something to point. And that was with people who inject drugs. Who is the community for a chim? you know, model is a little bit different, but we do have great ex experience and, and, you know, working relationships with folks who are at high risk and experience writing consents and doing stuff like that. So don't discount the, the history that we have for multiple types of trials with these folks. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, those points. Thanks, Kim. Thanks to everyone for the thoughtful comments and questions. There were a couple of um, really good questions uh, posted online. And I think Jake, there for you, if you could, uh, Jake Ebert, if you could wander over to the chat and address those, um, they're, they're really good uh, questions lingering there for you. In the meantime, thanks uh, on behalf of all of us, thanks to you and your other volunteers for your sacrifice and for your altruism. And thanks to you for your, your talk and to Charles and um, I'll hand it back to Dr. Liang.